And so our first invited speaker is um, Berivan. I actually met her uh, a, a, about six weeks ago or two months ago, perhaps, at this wonderful um, Hugging Faith uh, organized event where they were trying to really uh, bring the open source AI community together. And in short order, they had 5,000 people all come in one place. So we were there, a lot of, a lot of other um, AI um, open source companies were there, and also a lot of researchers were there. And that's where um, I started talking to her about her interest in federated learning, her application of um, Flower. And so it was an ideal situation here to invite her to present her work um, uh, today. So thank you so much for coming today. We're really delighted to um, hear about your work and, and, um, and connect you with the rest of the community. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, can I share screen? Uh, yes, if I stop sharing, then I believe okay. you'll be able to start sharing. Okay. Yeah, we can see the screen. Looks great. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so I, uh, thanks again for having me here today. Um, I'm a PhD student at Stanford and I'm working on federated learning, distributed learning. Um, and I will talk about our iClear 2023 paper today. Um, so before I give details about our work specifically, um, oops, uh, I will first go over um, some specification methods that are mainly used for model compression after training. And then I will show you how they have been adapted for federated learning to improve communication efficiency. So one uh, very commonly used method is model pruning. Um, again, we are, here we are talking about centralized learning. So um, uh, as usual, we first randomly initialize the weights, we train them to full convergence and we achieve some good accuracy, let's say 90% accuracy. And then to compress the model, um, we set the smallest uh, weight to zero. So we prune sometimes 90, sometimes 95% of the weight. And this method works surprisingly well, and we are mostly able to achieve the same accuracy even after pruning. Um, so magnitude is only one salience metric. There are some other ways, but like looking at magnitude is just so simple and it works surprisingly well in practice. And it's a very common method to compress um, pre-trained models. And this method has also been um, like adapted for the federated learning setting. So one very simple way to use pruning uh, to improve communication efficiency is to actually prune the model update. So at every round, the client updates their local model. And then before they communicate their updates to the server, they can just set the smallest ones to zero and uh, gain some communication efficiency. Or there are more complicated uh, ways to use pruning as in this slide. So um, for example, here in these two works, the server uh, initializes the network and then it sends this network to a client. The client alone performs some training and then finds a pruning mask. And um, then the federated learning stage starts. So all the clients actually tries to train this prune model. So um, it has maybe advantages and disadvantages. So one disadvantage is we rely on one client to do some training until full convergence and extract a good pruning mask. So that's, uh, I think, like one, one piece of this work um, that has less motivation maybe. And another line of work, again, like I'm switching back to the centralized setting, uh, the lottery ticket hypothesis. So in, in this paper, um, what they try to test is, like they, they ask this following question. So we are able to train a network and prune maybe more than 90% of the parameters and we are able to preserve the accuracy. So let's say we extract this subnetwork at the end. Then they, they ask this question, like what if we start with this architecture in the beginning? So um, what if like we actually use this subnetwork architecture which randomly initialized weights, would we able to get the same accuracy? And it turned out that uh, it's not possible to get the same accuracy. Um, but then they, they performed another experiment where um, they still like keep the same subnetwork architecture. Um, um, but they didn't randomly initialize the weights and instead they used the same initialization that they used in the beginning. And with this approach, they were able to achieve the same accuracy. So it's interesting, it just suggests that uh, we, we know that we can actually start with a very sparse subnetwork and we can only train that network to achieve the same performance. But the initialization is very important. The initialization and the subnetwork architectures are connected in some way. 
And the only way to find the correct subnetwork architecture for now is to first train the full network to full convergence, which is not very efficient. So there is still some ongoing research on that. And then, of course, it was also like adapted for federated learning to improve communication efficiency. But um, so I'm just referencing one paper here. They have the same like slight drawback here. So they their idea is like at every round, each client will train some local model. And they assume that the clients can train these models to full convergence and then extract lottery ticket networks, um, which may not be uh, reasonable in, in practice because the clients have limited data and we don't know if they can train these models to full convergence and extract lottery ticket networks. Okay, so um, there is um, so there is the third uh, like uh, sparsification approach, uh, which is more recent than the other two. So again, we are in the centralized setting, um, and these two papers I'm referencing, they tried uh, like similar experiments, and what they do is like they randomly initialize a network. So this network has all random weights and they never train the parameters. Instead, they find some connections. They extract some connections from this network. So, and they end up with a subnetwork, but with random weights. And they show that this subnetwork can achieve really good performance. So for example, I'm just uh, showing some figures from the first paper here. So the orange and this dark blue curves are performance of the, um, the, the train fully full network. It's not the sub network, it's the full network and we train the parameters. And the red and the uh, light blue curves, uh, so they almost achieve the same performance. And what we do here is like, we never train the parameters and we find sub networks with different sparsity. So for example, here the best performance is when we keep almost like 50% of the weights in the sub network. And the only difference between the red and the blue curve is how we initialize the random weights. So this seems like, a, um, like an interesting ob uh, empirical observation. And there is also some theoretical work um, where they studied how large the initial network, initial dense network should be so that we can find a sub network with a certain depth. Um, so it's theoretically and empirically motivated. Uh, it's an interesting observation because we never even train the parameters. We are just exploiting the fact that these models are too overparameterized, and we can even find some networks that works well with the random weights. So um, in this talk, I will talk about our work that tries to adapt this approach to federated setting. Um, but different from prior work, we will not rely on the client to like train a model to full convergence because we don't think it's realistic. And also we are not doing it just for the sake of like showing an adaptation of this method in federated learning. We will actually use it for to, to improve communication efficiency. Okay, so, so our goal is to um, like find these subnetworks with random weights uh, collaboratively across clients on the client's non-IID data set. So we are in the full federated setting. The clients have non-IID data set. There is partial participation and everything. Um, and we will do it in a communication efficient way. So we want to spend less than one bit per parameter. Whereas like in, in the traditional, like the standard federated learning, we have to use at least like 32 bits per parameter to communicate model updates. And empirically, we will show that our method converges faster than other methods that operate around the same bit rate. And we will also have like end up with an efficient representation of the final model. And I, I guess the idea is now more or less clear because I already explained the centralized setting. So the server will initialize a dense network with random weights. And all the clients will also have the same random weighted dense network with this, using the same random seed, basically. So each party has the same dense network with random weights and they everyone freezes the parameters. So they will throw out training, they will keep um, the random weights frozen. And instead, um, the clients will train a probability mask, um, which has the same architecture as the dense network. So this probability mask has these connections with values between zero and one, and each connection corresponds to the probability that like the corresponding connection staying in the subnetwork or not. So for example, if this value is close to one, that means that with high probability, this connection will stay in the subnetwork at the end. 
So our goal is to train this pearl to mask. Um, and then, so, so let's say the clients, uh, or like, let's say we, we have a pearl to mask that, uh, that is trained to some level. And at the inference time, or, or, at the, or during training at forward past time, what we do is we extract a binary mask from the pearl to mask. And the way how we do it is we um, sample a binary mask from the Bernoulli distribution parameterized by the Provost mask. And then this binary mask, again, of course, has the same architecture as the dense network. And it has um, values only zeros and ones. Uh, and using that binary mask, we can actually extract a subnetwork. Um, so uh, we basically multiply uh, the binary mask with the dense network, and we end up with a subnetwork with random weights. And then this subnetwork is used during forward pass. And so if it's during training, then we also compute a loss function. And then we backpropagate this loss function to update the probabilities and the probability mask. And we never touch the actual parameters of the dense network. So the clients perform these uh, iterations, like uh, these operations for a number of iterations at every round. And at the end of um, each round, they end up with their local probability mask. And ideally, they want to communicate this mask to the server and again, ideally, what we want to have at the server is the average of these probability masks um, to update the global probability mask. But we want to do it in a communication efficient way. So therefore, like uh, the clients will not communicate these probability masks directly. Um, they will try to communicate a compressed version of this. And what we propose there is uh, actually the same operation that we used during forward pass. So they uh, each client, once they compute their local probability mask, um, they will um, take a uh, binary sample from the Bernoulli distribution parameterized by their local probability mask. And then this binary mask has the same number of parameters as the probability mask, but now it only has zeros and ones. So it only has to communicate at most one bit per parameter now. Um, and then the server's estimate is just aggregate of the binary masks instead of the probability masks themselves. So here, um, I said um, we only need to communicate one bit per parameter for each client, but we can actually reduce this number significantly. So in our iClear paper, we propose some entropy coding methods um, to further compress it and like reduce the bit rate to uh, about 0.8 bits per parameter. And the way, I mean, the reason why it works is the entropy of this binary mask is actually um, not one, it's smaller than one. And the reason is, these uh, values zeros and ones are not equally distributed. Um, so there is no symmetry here. And what we observe in practice is most of the uh, parameters in the binary mask are actually zero. And because of this uh, asymmetry, the entropy is actually smaller than one. Um, and with entropy coding methods, we can actually reduce the bit rate down to that value. And then we have a follow-up work, which is not out yet. Um, there, we are actually reducing the, the bit rates down to um, 0.1 bits per parameter. So it's um, more than 10 times improvement and it will be out soon. And um, yeah, uh, ho hopefully um, you will also like our results there. So, okay, so the server's estimate is the aggregate of the binary masks, but ideally what we wanna have is the aggregate of the probability mask. And we can show that this estimate is unbiased. And we can also upper bound the error of this estimate. And these are um, necessary properties to prove some convergence results. So we can actually claim that um, the model will converge to the same point um, because we have an unbiased estimate and upper bounded error. Okay, so one last uh, point I wanna make is, um, so in this work, of course, weight initialization is very critical because we initialize random weights and we never update them. So we want to make sure that this initial dense network, um, this network is actually rich enough so that we can find these subnetworks. And for that, what we use is um, for each layer, we actually sample weights uh, from this set, um, only from like these two values. This sigma is actually the standard deviation of the caving normal distribution for that layer. And it has been shown in, in actually some prior work on centralized setting that with this distribution, um, empirically, we actually achieve better performance. And also using this distribution um, with like a support size of two, um, 
makes our storage very efficient. So after training, after like we finalize federated learning, we end up with um, a dense network that is actually frozen from the beginning and a, a binary mask um, that we actually extract during training. So all we need to store is these two values. And for that, what we need is actually a random seed to extract um, the dense network and a binary mask, which takes less than one bit per parameter. So it's actually like a, there's a huge saving um, in, in memory cost after um, uh, training. And a second property is at inference time, when we actually extract the subnetwork and use it for inference, um, each parameter is either zero because it's not a part of the subnetwork, or if it's a part of the subnetwork, it takes one of these two values. So we have a ternary representation here, and um, the, there are prior work, mostly like hardware oriented work that shows like some computational efficiency when the parameters are ternary or binary. Um, so we also believe that it actually uh, leads to some efficient inference, um, like in finding these uh, random subnetworks. So to show some empirical results, um, so we compare our method, we call it FedPM, Federated Probability probabilistic mask to some other uh, compression methods. So except Fed mask, all the other baselines are actually um, training the model parameters as usual. And at communication time, they um, apply like all sorts of compression techniques like quantization uh, or sometimes like some, um, um, some projections. Uh, and one common thing among all of them is they operate around the same bit rate. So if you look at the right plot, um, they are all close to one bit per parameter. Um, FedPM, our method is actually on average across rounds achieving a smaller bit rate than rest of the um, baselines. And if you look at the test accuracy, our method is actually able to converge much faster than all our other baselines. And it also achieves a higher accuracy. Um, so I think this result is surprising because um, without like actually running these experiments, I wouldn't expect our method to perform better than the baselines that are actually training the parameters. Because all we do is uh, we randomly initialize a network and we find good subnetworks and we hope that it will work. And it's actually working better than, like for example, QSGD is one of the strongest baselines and it's outperforming QSGD. Um, and the there's a fast convergence here. So this was the result on CIFAR 10 data set. Um, and we observe actually more significant gains on CIFAR 100, a slightly more difficult data set. Uh, and in the paper, you can also see our result on MNIST and EMNIST. I'm skipping those results um, uh, for the sake of time. Um, and yeah, so th the results I showed you previously are on IID data set. Um, with full participation. So it's not the most realistic scenario, but here we are actually, um, so we tested like various combinations of non-IID level and um, partial participation level. So for example, when rho is one, we assume that all clients participate at every round. When rho is um, 0.5, only half of the clients participate. So this is, for example, the most difficult setup. And this C max um, is actually indicating like, um, for each client, how many classes uh, they can see in their data set. So this also indicates non-IIDness level. So overall, um, this is the, I think, most difficult setup. And if you look at like all combinations, we have sometimes like um, up to 10% gain, um, even sometimes more than 10% gain in accuracy compared to like other baselines. Um, so this is the accuracy result. We can also compare the bit rate and um, in terms of bitrate, these two baselines are very close to our methods, Drive and Eden. But if you look at the accuracy, um, there is uh, like sometimes 20% uh, difference um, between FedPM and the baseline. Um, so this was a quick summary of our work. Um, maybe a few notes I can add here. So then we were actually like working on the iClear submission. Uh, we weren't uh, using a flower code, and at the submission time, um, we had some difficulty in scaling up our own custom FL code. But then after the submission, we were like, okay, so now we have time, let's write this code properly. And we switched to flower, spent some time, and everything 
just became much easier. Uh, we didn't even have to worry about anything um, uh, like uh, like scaling to like thousand, more than thousand clients, um, or like scaling the model size wasn't a problem anymore. Before in our custom code, we had a lot of memory problems. Um, so um, I think that was one factor why we were able to finish the follow-up work uh, in limited time. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. You can check our paper on archive. You can check our code. We will update our code base with the Flower implementation very soon. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. This is a great talk. And I'm happy that um, you found Flower um, helpful uh, in, your, in your research. That's amazing. Really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> great, great. Well, I, I see we've got a couple of questions. Let me just look at one question we got uh, in was, um, they say uh, you showed results uh, going up to Safra 100. Um, and they're saying that, but I'm paraphrasing here, but they're basically saying that, you know, doing these experiments can be uh, difficult. Um, given given your techniques, what type of experiment do you think might show its gains uh, best? They might, I, I guess they're trying to they're getting at the fact that running experiments on different data sets sometimes is a bit problematic. But is there a type of I don't know um, scenario or a scale of data set where you think uh, your methods would sort of shine even more brightly than they do? Mm, I see. So um, I think um, so one. Thing our method is exploiting is over parametrization. So mm -hmm. as the model gets more over parametrized, um, our methods, I think, will work better. Um, so for example, in our MNIST uh, experiments, we realized that um, like with, with slightly larger models, we were getting uh, more significant gain over the baselines because we are basically trying to find subnetworks. So the original network should be large enough and there must be some redundancies. So um, we didn't empirically observe um, any difficulty like across data sets, but for each data set, we observed that the model should be over parameterized enough so that we can actually find a sub uh, like a sparse solution um, to the problem. Oh, I see, I understand, that should make sense. And um, let me just see if there's any more questions. Feel free, everyone, to like you can enter on Slack or onto Zoom. I have a follow up to that, what you mentioned. Uh, so, did you explore, for example, um, for example, you need you benefit from an over parameterized model? So, did you study uh, how long does it take to amortize the communication cost of the initial communication cost of having this maybe potentially much bigger model than a very small mm -hmm. model I can train from scratch? Did you yeah, put that into a yeah. plot, for example? So uh, I don't have those plots here, um, and we don't have them in the paper either. But um, yeah, so so what we observe here is, for example, um, we used uh, a six-layer convolutional network on CIFAR-10 here, and we are able to achieve this performance. If we were to use a smaller network, um, that would give maybe the same bitrate. Uh, the accuracy is actually smaller. Um, OK. Yeah, so so it's it's not something like we over parameterize the network just to show some improvement. It's actually really improving the accuracy, like going taking that path. Yeah, yeah cool. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Um, also, I have a follow up. Uh, well, slightly unrelated question, but also very relevant, I think. So you were the clients locally; they are extracting a sub model from the peak model effectively, right? When they are applying the mask. Have you considered, for example, imposing some structure on how this, how this masking is? So you can take advantage of, for example, some training, training efficiency, because if you're extracting like a mm -hmm. random model, those, yeah. let's say, uh, random sparse multiplications are difficult to, to accelerate, but if you have a structure, yeah, that's a really good point. So I, I guess what you're trying to say is like we have a probability mask and we extract a binary mask, but the, there is no structure here. So when we do the forward pass, we are not gaining any training efficiency. So uh, this this is one of our uh, actually in in when I present this paper, uh, uh, usually I have this like final slide where I mention future work, and this is one of the future works. Um, I think it's it's a really interesting question. We don't know, of course, like if it would still perform well if we impose a structure here. Um, it's, I think, very open. I didn't see any work on that. Um, so I think we just need to 
That's right. Like, uh, yeah, if there is a thing like um, a force like structure in the binary mass, I don't know if we will still get the same performance. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, of course, it would uh, come with computational efficiency at training time. And I think it's very relevant, uh, like given that clients have only limited uh, compute power. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Great, great. Well, I see um, one last question. It's, it's quite uh, simple. The person just asking, have you seen any um, instances in your experiments where your uh, method uh, has an impact on fairness? Oh, that's a, that's a good point. We didn't check that. We, we never checked fairness. We only look at accuracy and bit rates so far. Oh. But that's, that's a really good point, yeah. Yeah, that's very, that's very reasonable that you can't test every uh, condition. I guess they were just uh, curious. Okay. Um, well, thank you once again. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's been great. To, great to see you again. Great to see this wonderful work. I think it um, really um, it, it provokes a few interesting questions about how we can make um, federated learning you know, more scalable uh, mm -hmm. moving forward, and how we can exploit some of these uh, you know these sort of interesting results uh, that have some sort of a bit of a theoretical underpinning to them too. Um, too. So that's great. So thank you so much. Thank Everybody. you so much for having me. Thank you.